Peace to you, sisters and brothers. Grace and peace to you, sisters and brothers. This is Amy Wilson Feltz. I am the pastor at St. Paul's United Methodist Church in El Paso. I am coming to you live from the parsonage here at St. Paul's, and I am so glad to be with you here as we consider our second sermon in the series that we are calling She Speaks. So thank you for joining me. If you'll let me know that you are here, we have our good friend Misha who is helping us connect today. And as you are coming online, I have been thinking lately about my spiritual practices and the things that are helping me stay grounded in the present, but also think about what's going on in the world. And so I would love to hear from you. Hey, Annette, how are you this morning? I would love to hear from you all about the spiritual practices that are helping you in this time of pandemic. Are you getting up and jogging in the morning? Are you reading your Bible with your kids at supper at nighttime? What are the things that you are doing to help you grow in this time? And so I would love to hear from you as you are connecting this morning. We do have a couple of ways to connect electronically today. So as you signed in, you may have seen our connect form and and our giving form. I do want to remind you as always that it's a great time to give to your local church. And in this time we are continuing to pursue our mission at St. Paul's to love God and to follow Jesus and to serve others. And so we invite you to consider giving online, it's such an easy way to do that, or you can mail your check in as well. So thank you for continuing to practice that spiritual gift of generosity as you are sharing your other spiritual practices. Um, Esther, Brian, um, we're so glad that you're here. If you want to share about some things that are going on in your life and your faith practices, I would love to hear that because we are going to talk today about curiosity as a spiritual practice, all thanks to the story of the woman at the well, which we find in John chapter four. So I invite you now to take a deep breath with me. As we enter into our gospel story from John chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 27 through 38 this morning. That's John chapter 4, verses 30, uh, 27 through 38 this morning. So just then, just then in the story, the disciples came and they were astonished that Jesus was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why, why are you speaking with her? And then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. And she said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything that I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, could he? Then they left the city, the people, the crowds, and they were on their way to Jesus. But meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. And that's when Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one else has brought him anything to eat. And then Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to complete his work. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me. Do you not say four months more and then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around. The fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper, the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into that labor. So in our tradition, we say, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God, amen. Hi, Janie, glad you're here this morning. I would like to invite you all to join me now in a short word of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight this morning, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. 
Our son, Augie, who is four, is an early riser, and he has always been an early riser um, from the time he was very, very young. But since we moved to El Paso in June, he has been waking up usually between 4 and 4.30 almost every day. It's almost as if he is, his body didn't make the transition from central time to the mountain time zone. And so Jason and I, as we've been trying to help him learn to sleep a little bit later, we bought an alarm clock that has a light in it. And if the light is red, that's a signal to Augie to sleep or at least stay in bed a little longer. And when the light turns green, then he's invited to get up for the day. Well, those of you who know me uh, even just fairly well know that I am an early riser as well, and I have been most of my life. And the morning time is the best time for me to think and to get some work done. And so it's not unusual for me to try to wake up before anyone else does in the house, especially in this time of social distancing and pandemic, because we're all in the house all together, all day long. So it is not unusual for me to be up and to be working when Augie comes bounding out of his room early in the morning before the sun comes up. And it's a familiar scene for me now. He'll he'll come with his hair disheveled and his brown eyes wide with that after sleep look. And he'll say, mommy, mommy, come and see, come and see. Y'all, I know what he has to show me. I know what he wants me to come and see. It's that light on the alarm clock because anytime he actually makes it to the point that it turns green, Augie is so excited and so proud of himself that he cannot wait to show me again. Come and see. This is an invitation that I receive from my kids on a regular basis. Maybe you all receive those invitations from your kids and your grandkids as well. Come and see. And chances are, chances are, we already know what they have to show us, right? I know that's true in my case. I often already know what the kids want to show me or tell me because I have seen it or I have heard it 100 times. And it's really easy to feel that way about life as well. Isn't it, Edie? Isn't it, Libby? It's really easy for us to think that we've seen it all. And even if a situation comes along that takes us by surprise, perhaps like the global health situation has for so many of us, at that point we're so tired and, and so overwhelmed by the pace of life and the needs around us that it takes quite a bit to get our attention and quite a bit certainly to keep it. And this could even apply to Jesus these days for us. Sometimes it's difficult for Jesus to catch our attention and to keep it. But Pop, that was not the case with the woman at the well, was it? This is the story that you told me um, even as a little girl. This is not the case with the woman at the well. We meet her in John chapter 4. When Jesus and the disciples are cutting across Samaria from Judea on their way back to Galilee. Bob, this is probably something that you have taught in your classes as well. They're making their way back to Galilee. And we're told earlier in the chapter that Jesus is tired from the journey. So he sits at a water well to rest. And that's when he encounters a woman who has come to draw water. So the disciples are gone at this point. They've gone to find food, and there's just Jesus and this woman. And if you're reading in John chapter 4, this could really catch your attention because already Jesus has broken two important social rules. First, he's talking to an unchaperoned woman. This is a violation of Jewish law. But what's more than that, he's talking to a Samaritan woman. And the woman responds by pointing out the error that Jesus is making. She later even cites this long-standing rift that the people of Samaria have with Jesus and his people, this argument that they have over where God should be worshipped properly. And that conflict, which had been going on for quite a long time, had led to total avoidance of each other. So disregarding these legal and social standards, Jesus engages this woman in conversation first by asking her for some water. And so she hesitates at that point and she questions Jesus' request. And that's the point where he basically says, well, if you knew who you were talking to right now, you would ask me. You would ask me for some living 
water. So if you're still reading in John chapter four right now, chances are you're hooked because this is where the story gets really, really good because it's Jesus who initially pushes those social boundaries, but the woman, to her credit, she rises to the occasion and she asks a polite version of that age old question. Well, just who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? And for good measure, she points out that Jesus didn't bring a vessel with him to draw any sort of water. And that's when Jesus cuts to the chase, chase and he says, the living water that I offer leads to eternal life. The living water that I offer leads to eternal life. So now he's talking. And the woman is listening and she is not a fool. So she drops her line of questioning and she says in a command form, give me this water, give me this water. And that's when it becomes clear that Jesus has been paying attention to far more than their conversation, Jason. Jesus has been paying attention to her life. He demonstrates that he has knowledge of the context that people who had not known her would not have known in any other sort of circumstance. And that tells the woman that Jesus is a prophet. And so she acknowledges that you must be a prophet. And that's when Jesus launches into this really great discussion about God's revelation and about worshiping God in spirit and in truth in a way that transcends the argument that the Samaritans and the Jews have been having about where God should be worshiped. So the woman responds beautifully with hope with hope in the Messiah, with hope in the Savior. And this is where it gets really incredible. Jesus reveals to the Samaritan woman at the well his identity as the Son of God. I am he, he says. I am that Messiah of which you speak. And that's where we enter the story today in John chapter 4, where I started reading in verse 27. That's where we enter the story. And then the disciples come back to Jesus and they see him talking to this woman and they want to ask him, but they don't. They want to ask him, what are you doing? What is possessing you to talk to this woman? And that's when the woman leaves. She leaves the well. She leaves the jar that she had brought to to pour the, to draw the water. That reason that she was even there, she leaves it and she goes back to the people and she says come and see come and see this man who knew everything about me could he be the messiah come and see come and see so last week we launched this sermon series that we're calling she speaks and it centers on four powerful quotes issued by four powerful women in our bible and we started last week with the words of mary magdalene later in the Gospel of John after Jesus has died and has come back to life when she says I have seen the Lord and that story credits her with being the first person to see the resurrected Jesus but also the first person to proclaim the resurrection so there is no doubt that the words of Mary Magdalene I have seen the Lord are powerful powerful words well these words of the woman at the well come and see, they are less obvious, especially because they are accompanied with this question about Jesus' identity. Could he be the Messiah? But I really think that that question is one thing that infuses the words of the woman at the well with great power, because that phrase, come and see, come and see, is dripping with curiosity. And the woman must have issued that invitation convincingly because the people in her town who heard it, they respond by following their feet toward Jesus. And now we're getting ahead of ourselves. Before we really consider the power of the words of the woman at the well, we have this little matter of the conversation between the disciples and Jesus to discuss. And this conversation is sandwiched between the invitation of the woman to come and see and what actually happens when the people come and see and meet Jesus face to face. So in between those two sections, in John chapter four, we find this 
conversation between Jesus and the disciples. So remember, Jesus is with the disciples and they have gone to go get food and they come back and they're wondering, but they don't say it out loud. They're wondering, why are you talking to this woman? And then they tell him, eat something. You need to eat something. And Jesus launches into this conversation about spiritual food, which he basically defines as following the will of God and completing the work of God. And then he talks about the work of God and the will of God as sharing the good news in an indiscriminate way, sharing the good news indiscriminately, trusting that God is always bringing people along the timeline to help us finish our work. There's someone always there to pick up where we leave off. We're picking up where other people leave off as well in our sharing of the good news. And so Jesus uses this analogy that we see throughout the Bible of sowing and reaping or planting and harvesting. And Jen, this is make you think about the garden that you are planting right now that you will harvest with your family later. There's a time lapse in there between the work of planting and the work of harvesting. And Jesus gets personal with the disciples and he tells them that they too are going to reap what they do not sow. They're going to harvest what they do not plant. And that's where we actually stopped reading in John chapter four. That's where we stopped reading. And if we just stopped there, it would be really easy for us to equate the woman at the well and her encounter with Jesus with the fruit of the harvest. And that is not a stretch by any means. That is not a stretch. She comes to faith in Jesus because of that encounter and that conversation. So we can certainly see that that encounter with Jesus bore fruit in her life almost immediately. But what happens next in the story really leads me to believe that the woman at the well also proves the other side of Jesus' point. That's where this story really catches my attention and holds it there because after the woman leaves Jesus, she goes back, as we said, she goes back to the town and she tells the townspeople what she has experienced. And she says, come and see, could he be the Messiah? And she does this in such a way that the crowd follows her back to Jesus. In other words, her witness of that conversation and that encounter with Jesus plants seeds in the hearts and the minds of her townspeople to the point that they are willing to follow their feet back to Jesus and see for themselves. So the woman caught their attention and Jesus kept it for two whole days. That's what we're told if we keep reading. In fact, the story is just so good. I wanna read more of it to you right now. This is in John chapter four again, but now we're beginning in verse 39. Many Samaritans from that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything that I had ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he did. He stayed with them for two whole days, and many more believed because of Jesus' word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we truly know that this is the Savior. This is the Savior of the world. Avon, it's all right there. It's all right there in the text. This is such a beautiful story. And the townspeople believed in Jesus, we are told, because of the woman's testimony, but it was also in hearing for themselves that they came to know that Jesus was truly the Messiah, the Savior of the world. In other words, the woman's words piqued their curiosity to the point that they were willing to come and see for themselves. And we can infer then from what we learn earlier in John chapter four, in the very beginning of the chapter, that the disciples had been with Jesus on this journey and they had been they had been baptizing other people as they came to faith. That's what we're told early on. So we can infer from that truth that the disciples would also, in this case, baptize the Samaritans who came to faith in this story. In other words, the disciples would reap what they did not sow. They would harvest what they did not plant. The disciples would mark with the ritual of baptism the confession that the people made as a result of the testimony of the woman 
which was given to the people before the disciples even re-entered the plot of this story. So what we can learn from this narrative and the story of the woman at the well is that the power of her words, the power of her invitation is in the fact that they were grounded in the identity of Jesus. The power of her words, the power of the invitation is that they were grounded in the identity of Jesus, the Son of God in the flesh. And what the people learn and what we can learn as well as we accept the invitation to meet Jesus is that Jesus is worth the effort of our faith. Jesus is worth the effort of our faith. Our curiosity, in other words, is not wasted on Jesus. Our curiosity is not wasted on Jesus, Leonard, and don't we know that to be true? Truly, in a time when we so desperately want to know all the answers before we make any sort of move in any realm in our lives, what we really need to rediscover right now, sisters and brothers, is our willingness to come and see. Our willingness to come and see. Now, that means that we have to first stop and acknowledge that we don't know everything that there is to know, even about Jesus. And the woman at the well can help us here because what she does is adopt curiosity as a spiritual practice. She, she maintains and nurtures this faith that leaves room for curiosity. Now, sisters and brothers, I'm going to say something here that may not be very popular, but I truly believe that curiosity is something that has become underestimated and undervalued in the Christian faith, especially um, as a people group in Western Christianity. Somewhere along the way in the last 2,000 years, we have become willing to trade our come and see curiosity for a false sense of certainty. And that is dangerous. Somewhere along the way, we have taken what we experience about God and we have devalued that and we have dissected it and distributed it to some people but withheld it from others because we are so concerned about where and how we worship God that we have forgotten about the heart of worship. We've forgotten about the reason that we worship, which is to connect with this God of mystery, to connect with the God of mystery, whose nature may be known in our holy scripture and in our own lives, but whose ways were never meant to be dissected again and withheld from some and distributed to others based on our own judgment. Sisters and brothers, our faith in Jesus requires reverence of the mysterious. It requires us to give room for God to work without exhaustive explanation of every little detail. It requires a willingness for us to come and see and to experience the infinite, the mysteriousness of God with out diving into this temptation to make it all make sense in our finite human brains. Imagine it with me right now, a faith that can catch our attention and keep it. Imagine with me a faith so mysterious and rich that it can catch our attention and keep it. Now that sounds exciting, doesn't it? That kind of faith, sisters and brothers, is not out of reach for us today. In fact, this is a perfect time in our lives and in the world for us to reclaim that sense of curiosity. It's a perfect time for us to reclaim that sense of the mysterious and to encounter God in our very own lives. So that being said, I invite you to stay tuned to all the different ways that we communicate right now at St. Paul's United Methodist Church because we're going to be launching in the next couple of weeks some new and exciting ways to grow in our faith, to learn about scripture, and to build our life of faith as a community. It all begins with a little curiosity and fortunately for us our faith in God can be strengthened by our questions just as the woman's conversation 
with Jesus at the well demonstrates to us. Our faith can be strengthened by our questions. Don't believe me? Don't believe me. Come and see. Amen? Amen. Thank you all, sisters and brothers, for engaging me in conversation this morning. I always look forward to going back to your comments and responding. So I'm going to stay online for a little bit. If you would like to contact me on Facebook, you're welcome to do that. I'm happy to connect with you in any way that would be helpful. I also want to give a shout out to my friend Diana, who made this beautiful cross. Diana, every time I look at it, I see another aspect of symbolism, and I just really appreciate being able to enjoy the gifts that you have, and I'm so glad that you are willing to share it. And I hope that we all continue to cultivate our spiritual gifts and that we infuse a little curiosity in, in that this week. And I would love to hear how that's working out for you. So please stay online and connect with me or connect with me later in the week and just know that you are dearly loved by me and by your God and by your church family as well. And if you would join me now, I will share a blessing or a benediction that I like to share in our community of faith before we close. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you would abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of our God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer who loves us very much. Amen. Go in peace, sisters and brothers. Have a great day.